Ja, du. Um, the reading is from Hebrews 12, um, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Welcome, it's great to be back with you and for those online it's great that uh, you've tuned in. I I heard, I was at a conference and they called those online Zoomies (laughs) and I don't really like that because it gives them identity so hi Zoomies, uh, that works for me. I I know you might not be watching on Zoom but I think it's a a good thing. I'm uh, Robert Heyman, the pastor, regional pastor of Eastern Victoria as you got together it got so well who was that Miriam so perfect um, my role is to just encourage um, support pastors and churches in eastern Victoria so I've got about 70 churches that I do that with so I basically get paid to drink coffee with pastors that's how I like to describe it um, and, and it's it's a good gig you should try it you know it's um, it's fantastic but I also get the opportunity to come and share with churches and preach um, which, which I love doing and I've shared with you a few times uh, for those that don't know me I, I live in Sale, Gippsland I've been down there since 1996 God dragged me down there kicking and screaming to be the pastor and I said I'll give you a year down there and uh, as God does in my life um, I'm still there uh, I'm not the pastor down at Sale anymore I was there for 22 years as a senior pastor and now my pastor is my eldest son so which is an awesome experiencing under your son's teaching and leadership Uh, uh, i just got to learn to bite my tongue every now and again Um, (laughs) that's okay he's uh he's um a better leader than i am a better preacher than i am um, but i've still got a bit of wisdom so that's good who was graded by that bible reading If you're an English teacher, you should have jumped up and said something. If I did that Bible reading at Sale Church, there would be at least one, if not three or four people, who would have stopped the person reading it and said, what's it there for? Because we started reading a Bible passage that says, therefore. We're halfway through an argument. We're halfway through a discussion. We're halfway through a reason. And we start and we go, therefore. So there's some foundation that we need to know before we look at those three verses. And and if you've been around church for a while, you'll know exactly what that foundation is. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. Those heroes of the faith chapter where person after person is, is commended for their faith. People like Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, one of the fathers, founding fathers of our faith, who, who held true to a promise of God, even though it was totally ridiculous the further it got on, that he was going to be the father of Israel that he was going to have a son. It was ridiculous, but yet he held true. People like Moses, who, who was, started off 
you know, started off life, you know, in, um, in, in a way that would almost set people back. He was adopted. And not into a culture that was one of his own, but a totally foreign culture. And yet he knew who he was and remained true. And when God spoke to him and says, you're the one to lead the people out of, out of captivity, he went, <laughs> me? <laughs> I don't think so. And he goes, yeah, you. And he was faithful to that. These heroes of the faith. I love the fact that these the Hebrews 11 has all sorts of characters in there as recognised as, Hebrew, as, 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 as heroes and heroines. I love the fact that we talk about how great our God is that Rahab is mentioned. Rahab the prostitute a heroine of the faith. Not someone to be pushed aside, kept quiet, sort of well, hidden away as a dark family secret, but someone to be put up in lights. Like, how, how many heroes are in, in the Old Testament? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds but the writer of Hebrews wanted to highlight a prostitute, a sex worker, as a hero of the faith. With that foundation, with that knowledge, therefore, the Bible says, Since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses. Who's your cloud of witness? If you were writing a Hebrews 11 for your life, who would you include? You know, th this passage talks, it, it gives the illustration of a, of a relay race. Who passed you the baton? Who's passed you batons in life, in your Christian life, in your faith journey. Ray and Glenda are down there, and you might not know them. They're fairly new, I think, but they were the person who handed me my first baton. A little guy called Clive Stebbins, who used to run Youth for Christ. A and, and I share this message and he's always the first person I mention. Always. As a little shy 14-year-old, I met Clive. Used to go to, I used to be a regular at church, Christmas and Easter, that's regular, dragged along. And, I, and my sister dragged me to this Bible study on a Tuesday night at Youth for Christ. And I just started to see something. I was, and to a degree still am, a very shy, insecure person. Clive didn't wait to see what I could become. But not long after I'd been going, I started tagging along to Sunday night youth services with Clive and a group of us, and we'd sit down in the front. And Ian, I don't know how bad your jokes are, but... I can guarantee Clive's are worse. They are shockers. Oh, no. Where, where do you keep your sunscreen? In a rubber tin, because that's what you've got to do. You've got to rub it in. You see? And that was one of his better ones, you know? <laughs> Let me tell you, they were, they were pretty ordinary. But we would sit there and endure this. And enjoy it, actually, but... But every time we went to a Sunday night service, he would pick someone to share a testimony. He'd pass a baton. 
I remember sitting there one night and he said, before I share, Rob's going to share his testimony. And I looked along the front row, literally, and thought, There's not another, is there another Rob here? I had never spoken in public. I didn't even speak in private, let alone in public. And I got up, I got no idea what I said. But I said something and sat down. But it sparked something in me. It sparked something in me. Clive saw something in me and drew it out by just keeping on passing me batons. Went to Bible college so I could get a job at Youth for Christ. Went to first year Bible college and I thought, oh. and, and the board at YFC said, oh, I think you need two years. I think I don't need more than two years. But anyway, they, were, they, were, they said, you need to do two years Bible study, Bible college. I thought, oh. okay. I'd already heard from God when I went to Bible college. I said, I'll go to college, but I'm not going to be a pastor. And God said, that's okay. I'm sure. I've got it in writing somewhere from him. I know. I went to a second year college, met a lovely lady, met my first wife. I only had one, but I met my first wife. <laughs> and, uh, but halfway through that year, I went up to a Bible college lecturer called Bill Foster, who I'd known through YFC days and other days. I said, Bill, I think God is calling me to be a pastor. I said reluctantly. You know what Bill's response was? Finally. He said, I knew that five years ago, but I was waiting for you to come to that realisation. And he passed me a baton and said, of encouragement. Barry Sutton, the pastor at Blackburn North Baptist, as it was then, New Hope, said to me as I was involved, how about you preach at a youth service? I go, me preach? I'd been at Bible college a bit, but never preached. I'm going, um, I'll give it a go. And uh, he asked me before, you know, about half an hour before the service, he said, can I see your notes? And I go, sure. And I pulled out a little card with three words on it. He told me later he freaked out. <laughs> but I had preached that sermon to the bathroom mirror 35 times. <laughs> I knew it word for word, you know. But he trusted me. He passed me a baton. He said, you can do this. Who have you had in your life? Pass your batons. That you're grateful and thankful to God for. You know, so sometimes we run our relay race with our hands in our pocket going, I'll find out someone might put a baton in it. I don't want a baton because with a baton comes responsibility. But with a baton, it's only yours for a period, isn't it? It's only yours for a little while. You just got to run a bit and then slap it into someone else's hands, don't you? So when I ask who's given you a baton? The other question is, who have you given it on to? Who have you passed it on to? I can think of people in my life that I've slapped a baton in. Sometimes it's been pretty clumsy the way I've handed it. Sometimes it's been fumbled. Occasionally it's been dropped. But I'll keep on passing the batons. The passage says this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I reckon, I reckon we, we know a lot about that stuff. I reckon we hear a lot about in churches, throw off all that stuff that hinders. Notice it's, 
the difference between the stuff that hinders and sin. Not everything that hinders is sin. It can be attitudes. It can be self-esteem. Something I've struggled with all my life. It can be all sorts of things, but we just sort of throw that off. People, when, when I say, you know, I've, I've struggled with self-esteem, my, my sister, her first boyfriend, Rodney, used to come over to uh, pick her up and would arrive an hour early every time. And I'd go, is he that keen? You know? Or does he just want to play billiards on our billiard table? Which is... And, and I would have to play billiards with him for an hour, which I didn't mind. But his goal was to get me to actually talk to him for that hour so he could pass me a baton. But actually just to... I was so shy and so insecure that I hardly talked to him. That, that, that's where I was at. I have to throw that off. As I pastor, as I share with people, I've got to throw that off. I am so comfortable in the corner of a room just watching the world go by. That is my happy place. I, I would be happy to do that. But I have to throw that off. Because that hinders me to do my task that God has called me to do. To recharge my battery, I go and hide in a corner. You know, that's okay. But I'm called to work with people. What do you have to throw off? What is it that's stopping you? Maybe there's some sin you need to deal with. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I will never be another Clive Stevens. I will never be a Bill Foster. My son will never be me. We are called to run our own race. Uniquely the way you are gifted and equipped to do so. Run the race marked out for you. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. It's so simple, isn't it? But how often do we fix our eyes on, on the leaders around us, on the people around us? Put them up on a pedestal. And, and if you see a fault, you go, oh, wow. This passage tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Don't worry about the other people. The person who passed you a bat and they're great, they may not be that great. They may have history. They may stumble and fall after they pass you the baton. That is irrelevant for your race. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the one. He is the perfecter. And the, and the, uh, the different passages, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. He's the one that, that you can keep your eyes fixed on. This whole relay passage, it breaks down at one point in the illustration. As I've alluded to, sometimes batons get dropped. And in a relay, drop the baton. You can train, you know, the Olympics. It's the only time we ever see relay races, really, on our screen. And if you're like me, every relay change, your sort of heart just stops a little bit. Don't drop it, don't drop it. And if they drop it, everyone goes. But in God's relay race, a God of grace and mercy and faithfulness, he allows us to pick that baton back up. Slap it in someone's hand or, or if it's been slapped in your hand and you dropped it, to pick it up and run. 
run your race. See, many would say Rahab dropped the bat and had it all messed up. Her choices in life disqualified her, but not for a God of grace, not for a God of mercy. I don't care what your experience has been, what has happened to you in the past, what you've chosen to do, or what someone's chosen to do to you. God of mercy says, therefore, pick up the baton and run. You are still a part of the great cloud of witnesses for those coming after you. Continue that relay race. No one is disqualified. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I used to be a middle distance runner. Way, way, way back. Now I'm a middle distance walker. Running the race takes perseverance, takes energy and effort. I walk the dog every morning and I see these people run past. Some of them are just running and they say, Hi, morning. Others run past and go, <gasps> and that's about all I can get out. I'd be one of those. Jesus asks us to run the race with perseverance. Sometimes it's tough. And that's why we need a therefore. That's why we need to be able to think back and go, wow, look at the encouragement. Look at the people who believed in me. Look at the people who believed in me. I guess because you're sitting here, you can identify some people who have believed in you. Some of you may struggle in that, and I understand. Some of you may go, well, I really haven't had that many people believe in me. I think if we explore that, there will be some, but there still may be not a lot. But I want to tell you about one who did, and one who does, and one who will, because he endured the cross for you. He believed in you so much that he endured the cross. And he slapped a baton in your hand and says, Now, be a part of my body, be a part of my family, be a part of my church, and go. And pass this baton on, this baton of love, this grace and mercy. Pass it on. I just want to close with this thought. We've talked about running our race in our lane. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. But we should also be very intentional about who we're passing that baton to. Fixing our eyes on him. Saying, it's coming. Choosing. Don't just run along going, who wants this? Who wants this? But be specific. And as I said, in my life, I've passed the baton to some people. They've picked it up, they've run with it. After a while they've gone, yeah, that's probably not for me, dropped it. And kept on running their own little race. 
You just give up and go, well, this is a waste of time. Or I can keep going and passing the bands. I tell you what, I sit under my son and, and, and I, I, there's, there's about four people in his life that I know of that I thank regularly for passing batons to him. I'm sure I had a bit of influence, but there were some people who, who outside the church, outside, because all he heard was me growing up. His only leader was me growing up. But these people kept on passing a baton to him. People in the Generations Ministry at the Baptist Union just kept on passing batons to him, feeding into him. And he blossomed. I, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to be passing into young people and, and, and other people who, who, who are, who are going to be faithful with that. And I'll just keep on trying to pass the baton and pass the baton and pass the baton. A bit like the sower of the season, just keep on scattering it out. But I'll be intentional. I'm not going to wait until they show till they're ready. We're never ready. I'm just going to pass a baton. Can you join me in passing batons? Talk about this church was planted by missionaries, as Jim said, who passed a baton and said, Okay, Belgrave South, you've got a community around you. You better pass the batons out. You better be intentional about it. You might be in your family, might be in your community, might be in your ministry, but pass a baton. Cheer them on. Run alongside them. You notice in a relay race, they run alongside. I've I, I watched a lot of videos on relay races preparing this. And, and you see the runner who just passed the baton yelling, yelling at them, encouraging them, cheering them on and, and running along as, as far as they can. Go, 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 you can do this, you've got this. Don't just pass the baton and go, good luck, and go the other way. But cheer them on, be intentional, because they're a part of your race. They're a part of your race. Your homework is simple. Recognise who's passed you the baton and thank God for them. Maybe even thank them. And then look at who you're passing the baton to and pray for them and encourage them and be intentional about it. Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for that great cloud of witnesses that cheer us on. We thank you for those that have sowed into our life in such a wonderful way. Father, may you give us eyes to see who we need to pass the baton to. May you give us a heart to encourage them, bless them and support them. And Father, may we see your kingdom grow as we run the race before us. Because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.